What's going on out there in the world of YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, all of the great stuff? I'll be coming in. If you're catching this live, appreciate it. Let me move my microphone a little bit closer. There we go here. How y'all doing on this Sunday night? Nice summer. Nice, is it? Yeah, pretty much nice summer night. One second here. One second. All righty. Okay, here. How's everybody doing out there? We're going to be kicking it off soon. I'm just sharing this out. Just sharing this out on my uh, other social media platforms. Oh, Brandon L., he's first in the building. There we go. So y'all can see the topic is going to be about building wealth the slow way, and I'm going to give y'all a personal touch. What's up, bro? What's going on, Brendan L? What's going on? Keesh, Keesh, hey, how's it going? If I said that right, hopefully I said that right. I'm just sharing this out real quick before we jump into the conversation. And I'm going to share some personal stuff with you guys, too, which helped my way of thinking. Right now, I'm at the age of 34. And at the age of 34, you know, um, I've learned some things. I met some people. There we go. Tony, sir, like, there you go. What's going on, Tony, out there in Cleveland? And I wanted to tell everybody, kind of share with you guys, building wealth the slow way. So without further ado, since it's going to be my podcast, too, if you guys aren't catching the podcast or you want to catch the playback, the podcast is, I'll call you back. I'm on the phone with, okay. That's the mirror of my home time. He said, I'm young. You think I'm young? Let's get it. Slow wealth, right? We're going to talk about slow wealth. Yes, I'm 34 years old, military 16 years. Along the way, I earned all my education. Uh, and I learned a lot, seen a lot, done some great things. And I'm excited, guys. I'm, I'm not going to lie. This is the week. We're coming on to launch week. You know, I know it's only the personal people that's going to, what you call it? You say you got the mind of a 60-year-old, too much knowledge. <laughs> Yeah, I got an old soul. Coming from the South, man, I got an old soul. Yeah, I'm only, and I look old too, Don. Dang. Yeah, I'm 34 years old with a son, eight-year-old, thinking about having one next year. Well, I'm only half of the plan, maybe. But uh, without further ado, let's jump into it. Um, Without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into it. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and children of all ages, this is the Investor Show. As always, this is your host, Prince Dice, coming to you guys and girls live from the beautiful state of Denver, Colorado. Don't forget that like, subscribe, comment, and share button. And to the next, uh, as well as always, I don't have a lot of time. I definitely know you guys and girls don't have a lot of time. And let's jump straight into it. I almost threw my outro in there with my intro. But anyway, you guys and girls, get the point. Today's topic, we're going to be talking about building wealth the slow way. You know, we live in a microwave society. When I say microwave society, we mean by everything is done fast. We want our food fast. We want our uh, we want our food fast. We want our success fast. We want education fast. We want everything fast, fast, fast. And I have felt the same way, right? When I very, very first started getting into investing, I know in the back of my mind, Walmart stock, which I don't even know what it is today, Walmart stock is not going to double on itself by December. It's just not going to happen, right? I mean, I can't say anything can happen, but the likelihood of Walmart stock doubling its value, we're in June, by doubling its value by December, it's probably not going to happen. The chances of McDonald's or Verizon or whatever company or Apple is going to double its value, meaning that it's $200 today, that it's going to be $400 by the end of the year, it's probably not going to happen. Berkshire Hathaway, the likelihood that it's going to double its value is probably not going to happen, right? So, when I started investing, I thought investing was fast money. He said, yes, our generation, we want everything fast, right? Man, oh, what's going on, Max B? I didn't see you there. What's going on, Max B? Uh, definitely. But we want everything fast. So I jumped into the same mindset. I said, man, you know, look at this McDonald's and Bank of America. These stocks going to take forever. So I picked the quick, fast, easy route. You know, I, you know, hey, let me jump into the marijuana. Let me jump into penny stocks. Let me jump into uh, Forex, um, options, day trading, anything that could get me something fast, quick, fast, and hurry, right? 
That's what I thought investing was. I did not know anything about, well, I knew, but I didn't understand the power of compounding interest. I did not understand the power of long-term investing, the index. Are you crazy by the index? Are you crazy by index? And watch you sit there and just do this over 20 years? Man, come on. I need it today. I need 20 months. But the sad truth is, how many people have a plan for next year? We are halfway done through 2019, and most people don't even have a plan for 2020, right? That kind of... <coughs> That kind of put in perspective. <coughs> that kind of put into perspective um, investing. That kind of put into perspective what this generation likes and what we expect of everything. I didn't understand that. Hey, you know what? When you look at it, it's three classes of society: low class, lower class, will always be a lower class. For there to be a top, there must be a bottom. So, regardless of what the government does. Regardless of what a politician says, they're already going to be a low class, a lower class. In order for me to have a ceiling, I must have a roof. I mean, in order for me to have a ceiling, I must have a floor, right? But here we go. So you got the lower class people. Usually people that fall into the lower class are usually uneducated, unskilled people. Uneducated, unskilled people that are usually work fast food. Not saying anything is wrong with it, but that's usually what you find in the lower class. I cannot work at chilies and wait tables by myself and have a middle class family. That's just not going to happen unless they're giving out some big tips. So the people in the lower class, the only way they can get out of the lower class and move to the middle class is to pick up a skill, to pick up some form of education or to pick up some form of knowledge to get themselves off of the lower class to the middle class, right? The middle class is most of the people that are tuned in right now. These are the people that are school teachers, uh, small business owners, uh, small business owners, school teachers, police officers, firefighters, uh, you know, you know, middle class, middle corporate America, middle management, that type of thing. Some military people here or whatnot. You know, we're middle level. We, we're the ones that um, we make a good living or make a decent living. We have a house, the car. We almost at the American dream, essentially. Right. But we're the ones. And let me get back to the lower class before I get all into the middle class, the lower class. When they make their money, they spend their money on things that make them feel good in most cases. Not saying everybody, but in most cases, meaning they go out, they buy um, maybe liquor on the weekend, maybe some marijuana on the weekend, maybe go dancing, um, maybe some clothes to make them feel rich. Um, he says, spit in fact, it's a single parent home, no generational wealth. That's true. So, you know, Jordans, tennis shoes, things that make them feel good to get them out of that. You know, hey, I want to feel nice. I'm a girl. All I do is work at McDonald's every once in a while. I want to get dressed up and feel good about myself and maybe go to the club or go something like that or whatever. Lottery tickets. Hey, we look at lottery tickets as our own way out. So that's what they do. Right. Middle class. We're the ones that spend the money on things that make us look wealthy. Right. You know, people, you know, Max B says people who don't know the difference between <laughs> guns and butter. <laughs> you got the guns and you got the butter. <laughs> oh, baby boy. Oh, my goodness. So that's true. Right. But the thing about it is the middle class, we're the ones that look rich. Right. We get the ones that got the nice house. We have a nice car. We have the nice watches. We're the ones that look rich, but we're not rich. We want us that buy the boats, uh, buy boats, buy, um, you know, timeshares, uh, you know, the things that, you know, go on little trips and things like that. Debt, right? Not buying assets. It's true. So we may buy a house or something like that. But the only way, then let's go, let's, before I get into that, well, we're speaking to it now. The only way for the middle class to move into the upper class is only one way investing i mean of course if you hit the lottery go to a casino and win big of course but in most cases it's to invest we have to take our income because the middle class people take their income and buy liabilities to make them look good you know we're the ones that get haircuts every week wear the nice clothes with a nice jewelry with a nice whatever the case may be and but that's not the, that's not the truth right 
So you look rich. We don't want to look rich. We feel rich. You know, you got the, you may be a school principal. You may be a local politician. You look very wealthy. You wear nice suits, things like that. I hate wearing, I won't say I hate wearing suits, but I'm not a big fan of it. But I, you know, I do it when I have to do it. But the thing about it is with that, the only way you can go for the middle class is to invest. You must take your income and invest it. Take your income, invest it every month, every every month, invest, 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 invest. And when you break it down, when you look at every wealthy person I have met, every not rich, but wealthy, you know, I know a lot of rich people. I know a lot of wealthy people. Well, not a lot, but I know some wealthy people. I know some rich people. Nothing wrong with rich people, but we're going to talk about wealthy people. Wealthy people, what they only get wealthy from three ways. Every one of them. They got some form of real estate. They have some form of stocks and they have some form of entrepreneurship. That's it. Either they start a business, they invest in somebody else's business. They got real estate. They got stocks. I started, you know, of course, I do stocks and stuff like that. But then I started buying land, right? Then, you know, land, next house, house, maybe run a property, whatever you want to do, right? So the easiest way is land to get introduced into real estate. That's another one, too. Artists, those are commodities, right? He brought up art. But when you look at it, the three common ones, the three most common ones is, hey, real estate, stocks, and uh, real estate stocks is some form of entrepreneurship, right? You know, a barbershop, that's a business, right? He said, you're not going to get rich buying bonds. Probably not, unless you're making a crap ton of money. I got some friends who have a quarter million, a half a million into bonds, and they get interest, and it'll just take them longer, Right? Goes back to the rule of 72. Those are the three main ones you find any wealthy person. And I almost guarantee you, everyone that I have sat down with, talked to, had dinner with, you know, they've given me any piece of game. I noticed three things from them real estate, entrepreneurship, stocks. Real estate, entrepreneurship, stocks. So with myself, that's what I started doing buying real estate, you know, buying real estate, buying stocks, and start investing into entrepreneurship. Those are the three things that I see that are the most common things with wealthy people. And the thing about it was growing up in my head, the media taught me that playing the lottery, playing the casino, um, the lottery, the casino, becoming an athlete, that was the only way to get the wealth, right? You're a good football player. You go to college. You're good for two years. You go to the pros, instant millionaire, right? Or crap ton of money or whatever, right? So that's what I thought. Hey, that's what investing is. Investing is lottery ticket. Or you sit back and you watch the show of something venture. Something venture. What is something venture? Something venture is a it was on Netflix. I don't know if it's still there. It's about these venture capitalists who went out and brought into these small companies, right? Oh, you're trying to find the next Facebook. Um, can you explain on uh entertainment there, Tony? But yeah, I, oh, another one. Yeah, you're right. Entertainment. I thought that, hey, be a rapper, singer, dancer, comedian. That was the only way. Right. Nobody taught me, hey, you know what? You can be a blue collar person, you know, go to school. You can start out as a blue collar person and go to school, get some education, become middle class. And once you become middle class, set back and uh, invest 10 to 20 percent of your money. Then, you know, buy a house, start some form of entrepreneurship. You do that for about 20 years. You're going to be you're going to be rich, right? Nobody, <clears throat> you're, going to, you're going to come to a million dollars. Wow. Nobody told me that. I didn't even think that was possible. What story of anybody that you see, that's how people become wealthy. You're not going to work a job. Middle class person is not going to work a job and become rich unless you are some fancy type of doctor, right? Or unless you're some fancy type of lawyer, not just general lawyer, not just general doctor, but hey, I'm a fancy lawyer, I'm a fancy doctor, and I make a bunch of money, and that's going to pass off into me becoming very wealthy. You know, I make a lot of money through my job, right? But the thing is, if you're a middle class person making $100,000, you and your wife making $100,000, $80,000 a year, you make $100,000 a year, you find a way to live off of 60, and if you invest $20,000 a year for 20 years, getting 7% interest, I didn't do the math on that, but it's going to be, you're going to have a nice, pretty piece of, of change, right? If not a million dollars, right? Because I know 20, 20, uh, 20,000 times 20,000 is 400,000 without any interest by itself. 
Imagine if you put that into the stock market, the S&P 500, and got 7 to 10% a year. Compounded on top of each other, how much money would you have? Right? Now I got it. Now y'all got me interested. I'm about to pull up my uh, compound interest calculator. Right? So we said 20 years, $20,000. So we're going to start off with zero. And we're going to say for 20 years. And we're going to say you got, let's say, 8% return on investment. Right? And you put in. 20,000. Let's do 20. How much is 20,000 divided by 12? $1,666 a month. Right? So here, here it is. Here's a simple way right here. Right here, right? Let's say if you are, you made $50,000 a year, your wife made $50,000 a year. But y'all figure out a way to live off of $80,000. And you invest $20,000 a year. Living off of $80,000, depending on where you live. Here in Denver, you can live nice. You know, okay. But, I mean, if you're in New York City, of course not. But depending on where you live, living off of $80,000 ain't a bad deal. And you and your wife making $50,000 a piece or spouse, husband, girlfriend, whatever you're into, uh, that's not too far off, right? And think about it. I just did the math. If you invested $1,600, $1,600 a year at 8% annually for 20 years, you got $981,000. That's almost a millionaire. A millionaire. That's saying like my wife is a school teacher and I'm a school teacher. We got $100,000 a piece. We save with 20, we just live off of 80,000. We put 20 thousand dollars a year 16 she put in eight hundred dollars a month i put in eight hundred dollars a month and we just invest 25 we got married at 30 by the time we were 50 we we're millionaires that's building wealth the slow way right when you're looking at that i didn't talk about oh get this you know because when i thought about the world when i came into the world of investing i thought investing was finding the next hot penny stock Finding the next hot Bitcoin, finding the next hot casino, or finding that new startup company that's going to sell for blah, blah. Because the media is not telling you, the casino is not going to tell you about the 99% of the people that's losing. They're only going to put up the pictures of the winners. The lottery is not going to tell you about the millions of people that lose every single day. They're only going to put up the pictures of the people that are winning. When a venture capitalist invest seed money into Facebook, they're not going to tell you, hey, I actually invested money into a hundred other companies. None of them worked out. So uh, none of them worked out. Only one worked for me. So, you know, no, they're going to tell you, oh yeah, I put money into Facebook. They're not going to tell you what I tried like a hundred other companies. Like on Shark Tank, they don't do episodes on the failures. They don't come back and say, hey, you know what? Let's bring back that company that we invested in that failed. No. They're only going to bring back in the winners, right? So when you do that, that gives the perception of that's what kind of groomed me as an investor to say, hey, I need to find the next winning company. I need to find the next hot stock. I need to find the next hot industry, whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's weed, marijuana, whether it is whatever the case may be. So you're trying to think of ways to get rich the fast way because nobody is breaking down to you, giving you the financial education to tell you that, hey, listen. That's like better than go to the NFL, right? That's like better than go to the NFL. That's like my son, right? What is the? I think they, I think somebody told me that only 0.25 of college students go off into the NFL. 0.25, less than one percent of the students go to the NFL. So what's the likelihood of my son Wesley going to you know playing little league, going to high school, going to college, going to the NFL, right? And then if he go to the NFL, that he's any good to stay for five or six or ten years. That's almost like a, actually, you know, that's like a that's like lightning striking the same place three times. So the thing about it is, when you put those numbers out and say, "Hey, man, listen, son, you you might be good at the sport, but the likelihood of you going playing professional and making a paycheck off of it is pretty slim." But this is how you could get on the winning side of everything, right? Think about it. Every month, you brought a piece of land. It's land going for $3,000. It's land going for $1,000. It's land going for 
you know, he says something now, right, Tony? Like, think about it, Tony. The, the children's investment club that you got, they can afford a piece of land, right? Now that they can afford a piece of land, hey, we're going to buy a piece of land. We're going to buy a house. We're going to invest money. Where's land that cheap? Okay, I will have to do a video on that. Because think about it. Where are you from, LH, LSJ19? When people think of land, they think of New York City, LA, uh, big cities. Don't you know in Colorado, uh, Virginia, right? Don't you know in Colorado, and you know how much desert is in Colorado? You know how much desert is in Wyoming? Do you have a clue how much desert in Idaho? How much desert is there in Texas? Who's ever driven through Texas? Drive through Texas. Oh, my goodness. I've driven through Texas like four or five times. You drive through Texas, and it's literally desert, 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 desert for miles. Go down in Mississippi. Go down in Georgia, Alabama, Louisiana. There's land out there that just nobody wants <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. Somebody inherited from their great-grandparents. They're just paying property tax, and they want to just get rid of the crap. That happens everywhere, how it always happens. I I give land to my son. My son says, thanks, Dad. He passes it down to his grandchildren. He passes it down to his grandkids. His grandkids, they just paying property tax. They're like, man, our granddaddy brought land out all in Colorado. He got land in Arizona. He brought land in Mississippi. I don't use that crap. He said, Miss Louisa. That's true if you buy mostly towards the water side, but go up north. Go up north in Louisiana. You know, I'm, I'm, I don't say go get flood land, but go up north. Think about in Colorado how many mountains they have. Think about who goes to Montana. Google right now land for sale in Montana. Half of Montana is probably not even populated. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I guarantee you, if you look into Montana, Idaho, uh South Dakota, North Dakota, you'll find some land out there that somebody like, man, you know what? You can buy this lot, this acre or whatever, and they'll just give it to you. I won't say give it to you, but they're willing to sell it for cheap. You ain't got to go out there and get five acres in New York City or right outside of a city. Go out there into the country of Colorado and get you some pieces of land, uh, you know, purchase some pieces of land. But what happens is my grandchildren, all they're doing is paying property taxes, right? They're just paying profit tax. They're like, man, we don't even know where this land is at. Man, this land, our dad brought, our granddad brought all this land all over the United States. We don't know where this land is at. You know, it's all over the place. It seems like a liability to us because all we're doing is paying property tax. So guess what they end up doing? As soon as the first person come along that want to sell it, they get rid of it. Hey, you want to buy it? $50,000? Have it. They're willing to get rid of it because they don't see the value in it. So there's land all the way across America. Don't look into your little city or look around your city and think about that. You in Virginia, don't just look in, you know, well, I don't see land like that going in, in Virginia. Go across to what you call it. Yeah, but what type of capital gains are you going to make off the type of land? And Mike Mike Mass says, yeah, but what type of capital gains you're going to make off uh, that type of land? And why would I assume it would appreciate greater than the rate of inflation? True, right? But the point is accumulating assets, right? Because with land, right, what I can do with land, I can use, let's say if I purchase a piece of desert land in Colorado, right? Number one, it's better than the savings account. So now, let's say 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now, I can use that land as collateral, right? I can use that land as collateral. I can go back and use that land as co collateral. Right. I can say, hey, you know what? Hey, uh, bank, I do have this land. It's valued at five thousand, six thousand, eight thousand dollars. Um, can I borrow against it? And the bank may say, you know what? Since you have hard assets, we'll give you six, seven thousand dollars to borrow against your land. You take that six, seven thousand dollars. You can go start a business. You can go invest into your buddy's business. You can make go buy yourself a bigger piece of real estate. You know, use it as a down payment to do whatever you want to do with it. And then if the deal goes through, they take some land that you wasn't even using in the first place. So at the end of the day, it is an asset, right? So not saying that's going to be your only asset, but that is one asset to where, hey, I'm I have some form, some piece of real estate. Then I also have some form of piece of stocks. 
So I just showed you how a regular every day, my dad makes 50,000, my mom makes 50,000, we live off of 80, we invested 20,000, forgot about it. 20 years from now, by the time we're 50, we're millionaires, right? That's building up wealth the slow way. Every year, you brought a piece of maybe land, and guess what? With property tax, guess what you can do with property tax? You can write property tax off, right? But the thing is, then you buy your house. Your house is accumulating equity in most cases, right? But just having a house, investing in the stocks, starting some form of business over time, if it's a good business, you're going to build wealth along the way. It's just like I tell people, uh, I don't know how many people in here live have served in the military. When you serve in the military, right, you have I always tell people your future is what you do outside of work when you take off the uniform. If you someone that hit the gym every single day, you're going to have a nice body, right? There we go. U.S. Armor, Mike Mess. So you can attest to this. If you get off to work every day and chase girls in the future, you're probably going to have a couple of kids or a couple of angry women, right? If you get off work every day and you drink, you're going to have a high tolerance for alcohol. You're going to be, you know, you see, I see them all those type of guys all the time. If you're someone who get off and go to uh, school every day, you're going to end up walking across the stage, getting a degree, right? If you're someone who um, who gets off of work and plays video games, in five or six years, you're going to be at ultra level number, whatever the case may be. And it's the same thing with our income. If someone keeps investing every time they get paid, whether it's stocks, bonds, real estate, stocks, bonds, real estate, stocks, bonds, real estate, entrepreneurship, building a business, nine times out of 10, slowly over time, that person is going to build wealth, right? Invest into yourself. Invest into yourself. You may go to school. You know, you may go to college. Go to college, pay for your own college, uh, earning certifications and degrees, making yourself more marketable, right? So anytime someone does that, and that was the biggest lesson, that was the biggest lesson I learned from Berkshire. You know, people were thinking it'd be stocks, this and that. The biggest lesson I learned from Berkshire, you know, some of the people that told me, they said, hey, listen, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, it, you, you're going to win over time. The thing is, along the way, the discipline. Somebody said, somebody asked Warren Buffett, they said, hey, man, why people don't listen to you when they talk about investing? Why they don't invest like you? He said, simple. You know, people don't want to get rich slow. <laughs> people don't want to get rich slow. You know, you tell somebody, hey, guys, just invest your money into the man, Come on, man. I'm not trying to hear that crap. I'm trying to get that new option spread and this and that and that, which is there's a place for that. But that's why this channel used to be very big on options and very big on this stock. And that. But I changed my way of thinking along the way because I knew that the people that was listening to me and that was following following me was not going to be able to get what I was doing. And it was going to be losers. It was like I had a meeting with a guy the other day. I don't even know. He might be listening right now. I'm not going to call his name. He sat down and he said, Prince, man, I play professional basketball. And he said, when I play professional basketball, I started a professional training camp for kids, teaching kids to help get them to the league. And he said, out of the 20 kids that I had, or 20, 30 kids, maybe two of them went off to college, got a scholarship. And he said, the rest of them just kind of, you know, went on by their lives. And he said, man, when he saw the attrition rate that he knew, most of these kids that I'm training are not going to go to the next level. You know what I mean? Most of these kids that are training right now, they're not going to go to the next level. Most of these kids are going to become everyday people. And then he realized, he said, man, I want to give these kids financial literacy. I want to give these kids uh, life skills, and he wanted to bring in other things along the way. So he said, hey, if you don't go to the uh, college and play basketball, you will wind up, you learn something about finances, you learn something about X, Y, Z, you learn something along the way. So it's the same concept. I bring up that concept to say um, people like to look at the things that are going to go the fastest. Nobody wants to sit back and say, hmm, I don't have to do anything crazy. All I got to do is just get, you know, like, think about it. It's how I like to paint it out for a child. 
Congratulations to the class of 2019. This is the way I like to pay and pan it out. Your kids come out of college. You save for your kids, just regular saving and investing. Let's say if you save 20 grand for them, 30 grand. They become 18, 19 years old. They got 20 grand for them, right? You put them through community college to get a skill. They may learn Cisco routing. They may become a barber. They may become a plumber. They may become an electrician. Something with a skill, right? Now with that skill, they can earn a nice livable wage. They don't have to work at fast food and get you know $20 an hour and things like that. Now kids, while they're in college, they can even drive Uber on the side and make a little pocket change or something like that as well, right? So things that wasn't available back then. So now, now that the kid has a, a, a trade, instead of them going out and making a job making $9 an hour, they can get a job making maybe 15 to 20 bucks an hour, depending on where they live. And now with that money, they can take that money and do what? <laughs> Invest it, right? To go off and earn a college degree and maybe uh, go off, earn a college degree and start life out tax, not tax free, but debt free, right? Because think about it. The thing that we don't look at right now, if I want to go use my toilet, my toilet was broke. I'm not going to call a mechanical engineer. I'm calling a plumber. If all my lights shut down in my house and the lights are not working, I'm not going to call an electrical engineer. I'm going to call an electrician, right? Even if my computers stop working, who are you going to call? Oh, I got a bachelor's degree in computer science. Or are you going to call the guy who has a certification in Cisco routing or whatever to fix your router? So those are skills uh, that are people are looking over with. All right. Let's say Keisha Keisha said that's because we live in a microwave society. We want everything fast, but the reality, not the way it is not healthy and it's not profitable. You're right. And but society has conditioned us that way. They don't show the stories. The media doesn't put out the stories of, hey, this is what my family did. We just invested into this and this and this. Nobody wants to hear that. Everybody wants to hear the story of, hey, you know, one day I was uh, I walked into the 7-Eleven, got a ticket, and now I'm a millionaire. And, you know, I put a bunch of money in Bitcoin 10 years ago, and now I'm a millionaire. Or I played a lottery ticket, caught a nice hand at casino. Um, brought this wild stock that went crazy. I put my whole life savings in it and I got lucky. So now I'm a millionaire. Nobody wants to sit back and use, hey, you know what? If I pay down my debt, put an emergency savings to the side, use my regular income as a middle class person and just invest. Like, like one of my buddies, he makes, he's probably like 24, 25 years old. I'm not going to say the company he works at. It's a big company. And he has, a, you know, probably about a quarter million dollars. He's 24, 25 years old. He calls me all the time, Prince, man, where should I put my money? Should I do this? And do this? I'm like, dude, <laughs> all you got to do is just keep investing. You're going to be a millionaire by the time you're 30. Well, I need to diversify. I need to do you overthinking this. What is the biggest purchase item a middle class person is going to buy? The biggest ticket item a middle class person is going to buy. Who's going to answer that? In your lifetime, a regular person, guess what the biggest ticket item you're going to pay for? Exactly, Mike, miss a house. To get a nice, decent house, probably cost you about $400,000 here in Denver. And you save up enough money to pay for a house, or you invest enough money, you pay for a house, that's the biggest ticket item you're going to pay for. Now, pensions can pay for, of course, you're going to have like property value and, you know, gas, lights, water, stuff like that. But if you can invest enough money to pay off a house, everything else is easy. Take myself. You know, I retired from the military in four years. I get a pension. I earn a pension, right? I earn a pension. And if my house is paid off, that's majority of what most of everybody money goes to. Your house is paid off. Aren't you financially free? Right? Depending on the lifestyle you want to live, you're like, well, I don't have a mortgage. So the rest of my money, I can set back and I can live off of this money or I can go earn more money or I can do X, Y, Z. So the thing about it is 
through our life, I grew up and I saw people with nice cars, nice watches, nice things like that. And I immediately thought, oh, they had that because they're successful. So as soon as I got in a position to where I could have afford something like that, I brought it because I thought, hey, that's part of being successful, you know? And the next thing you know, the next thing you know, you start to realize, man, I'm not even really in the jewelry. I'm not in, really into these fancy cars. Then you get around rich people and wealthy people, and you start to see that they're they're not into that stuff, right? And the idea is, when I start to evaluate the world and I start to look at the world, I start to realize that people are more concerned with looking rich than being rich. I started to realize, why wow, all these rich friends, I would say trade school, trade school first, get a trade, get a skill, trade school first. Who's more valuable in life? Somebody with a bachelor's degree in psychology or somebody who's a plumber? Somebody who has a skill in painting houses. Look at who has a who's going to be more valuable in life. Someone who has a skill with knowing how to build a house, or somebody. Hey, I got a bachelor's degree in business. You know, that's it. I learned that more people are concerned with looking like success than being successful. And the reason why I can speak to that because I was one of those guys. I didn't know it. I really didn't. I thought that, hey, this is what you got to do to look successful. This is what you got to be. This is, no, 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 no. Until I started to, you know, um, I was blessed to meet a lot of um, wealthy people. And I was blessed to meet a lot of rich people and to talk to them and to see what they were doing in life. And I understood differently. You know, I used to think like, oh, I got to have a big Gucci and a Marty suit and, you know, Louis Vuitton watches and rings. and the rich people I knew I had that, but then I, I meet the wealthy people. I'm like, wow, these wealthy people had way more money than this rich guy. Why they're not into this stuff? And you get to talk to them, and you get to know them, and you say, oh, wow, there's a difference between rich and wealthy. All right, somebody wrote in here and said, uh, for our people, bro, it's culture. It is. It is culture. You know, you don't want to look broke. If you saw me in regular life, or for the people that have seen me in regular life, they probably would think I was poor. And the reason why I don't mind people assuming that I'm poor, because people don't ask you for money. People don't ask you for money. <laughs> when, when, you, when you look poor, when you look like you're just barely making it, nobody asks you for money. It's the point of when you start to wear the watches and the rings is when you, you guys, I would, I don't mean to be mean, but I have so many DMs with uh, people that want to talk to me on the phone, right? And I have I have no problem with talking to people on the phone that I actually know. It's just that, hey, hey, Prince, somebody told me about you and blah, 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 blah. This is my phone number. Can we get on the phone next week? And I'm like, dude, I have too many scheduled things. You know, I only have so much time. I got so many scheduled things. I don't have the time to talk to people every single person, just regular. I say, hey, well, you know what? I'm going to be at this place live and you can go in and speak to me or whatever the case may be. I don't have the time to sit back and just talk to every single person on the phone. To do it just, just, I just don't have the time, man. That's crazy. You know, uh, I appreciate the support. I appreciate the love and stuff like that, but I do not like that, you know, at all. Uh, for people's culture, mutual fund and index fund. What's that? Puffer Puffer says, Mutual funds and index funds. Me, personally, I like low-cost index funds. Mutual funds are usually actively managed, meaning they cost more money, whereas the index funds are passively managed, meaning they cost little to no money, uh, expense-wise. So me, I'm more of an index guy. Uh, Mike Metz says, it's systematic from how and what we value. That's true. ETF indexes are cheaper. Okay, he's speaking to him. But yeah, it is systematic. You know, we're taught. Look who snuck up behind me. What's up, Wes? Hi. You been riding your bike? It keeps making noise and I try to fix it. Oh my God. You probably don't switch the gears on it. You switch the gears on it? You move the bike? 
Will it ride still? Can you ride it? Yeah. Okay. I think you switched the gears on it. And it's probably got to, you know, I go out there and help you out and look at <laughs> Spider-Man. <laughs> hey, Wesley. Wesley, go grab those uh, books out of the kitchen. Daddy? I think I already showed y'all those books. Yeah, go grab the books out of the kitchen. But, hey, but uh, anyway. <laughs> so, yeah. Daddy? Yes. 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 Now he want to ask, can he have fruit snacks? Max B, you said this the last time. He all he always waits till I get on camera. Then he always going to ask me for something every single time, like clockwork, because he know I'm going to say what you call it. <laughs> he said you gotta say yes, Wes. No, it's eight o'clock at night here. It's eight o'clock. Yes, yes. You know. <laughs> He <laughs> said smart, can't say no. He always wait till I get on this. Like, oh, yeah, Dad, can I have this? Can I have? But anyway, uh, yeah, it's eight o'clock here in Denver. But um that's the whole uh that's the whole thing or whatnot, right? And um when we look at life, we want everything fast, we want everything quick. We're looking for the I have so many people that hit me, hey man, I'm looking to do this, do this. I'm like, dude, you making a hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year as a single man with no debt. You got a quarter million dollars sitting in your savings account. Thank you. You got a quarter million dollars sitting in your savings account. Thanks, Wes. You got a quarter million dollars sitting in your savings account. Dude, you're going to be rich in about, you're going to be a millionaire in so many years. You become a millionaire, you're going to, be, but some people are looking, oh, I need to make more faster. And this is this, this, whatever, you know, nobody wants to waste the time. Oh, my, of course. Yes, I read uh, Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham. He said, Keystone Stacker said, your son is going to know about compound interest. That's a real gift. But that Spider-Man hoodie looks like a nice gift, too. <laughs> That's true. That's mostly uh, we got to take our time. Which to invest in stocks or real estate? I'd like to do both. You know, I like to do stocks first because it's simple, easy. It's the easiest one to get into. And then I like to gradu uh, graduate into real estate. But yes. Uh, yes, I don't really buy the gifts. I mean, I buy things that they need. It's mostly his mom and family and stuff like that. But uh, one of the things I want to show y'all, I think I did the last time. If you're here in Denver, as y'all know, that was my first book. Second book. And this Friday, guys, is finally here. Boom. The third book, Changing the Game. Wesley learns about insurance, the world's first children's book on insurance. So we did Wesley learns to invest. Wesley learns about credit. And this Friday, Broncos Boys and Girls Club at 2 p.m., we are launching Wesley learns about insurance, guest starring NFL Hall of Famer Terrell Davis. And I will be on My House Sports Thursday. I'll be on Channel 2, Colorado's own uh, Monday morning. And I'll be on Fox Denver Monday morning. And then I'll be at the Broncos Boys and Girls Club, hosted by Broncos Hall of Famer Rod Smith. Very excited about that. Right? So it's recent. Okay. All right. All right. All right. He said, I think that he said, I think that maybe majority live lower class people. And I think I consider myself maybe lower class. Because even though I have a skill, still live paycheck to paycheck, but the lower class. Okay, Keish, Keish. Um, he's saying he's live paycheck to paycheck. If you're living paycheck to paycheck, I, I learn quick, fast, and in a hurry that it's not about how much money you make. Because I've seen people who have moved up the ladder and they still live paycheck to paycheck. Because as you move up, you accumulate more stuff, Right. You don't say, hey, I'm making more, so I'm going to invest more. No, people make more and they spend more, right? Um, let me see. Don't understand how to build wealth. Okay, Keish, Keish. The thing about it is, I don't know where you live. I don't know your whole situation. But the thing, how I look at it is, first, you must invest into yourself by um, whatever you make. Let's say if I make $20 an hour, right? You got to first get yourself out of debt. Get yourself out of debt. Put some money to the side 
for emergencies, maybe about five hundred or thousand dollars. And whatever debt you have, you gotta attack that debt like a wildebeest. Once you can get yourself out of debt, you gotta change your habits. You gotta change your habits to realize that hey, if I don't have cash, I can't afford it. You know, even this is that something that's hard that I'm still struggling with, right? Because in life we're taught, hey Prince, you want fifty thousand dollars a business line of credit? Hey Prince. You want a half a million dollar house? Hey, Prince, you want, hey, you you know, you qualify to have a Jaguar. Prince, you qualify to have a blah, blah, blah. So you're like, oh, really? So you're so used to now, 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 now. And that microwave society is why we have debt. We don't sit back and think that, hey, you know what? Wesley needs a new bike. The bike is going to cost him $100. So uh, let's take some time and, you know, let me save up $20 and buy the end of next month. I better buy a new bike, right? We don't think that way. We're like, man, you know what? I could just throw this thing on a credit card, get it today, pay the credit card off. Now, and instead of spending $95, we end up spending $150 by the time we end up paying the thing off, right? Because we just talk microwave society. Anything that make Americans lazy, that's how we do, right? Uh, which platform I use between TD Ameritrade and E-Trade? Wealth is passed from generation to generation. Private is passed the same way. Finances aren't taught as a cornerstone in most in most houses. That's true. And uh, it, it's not taught as a house. And when I look at, that's why I write children's books. Because I feel as though the conversation is not being had. No way in the world a kid is not going to walk into a store or go on to Amazon and say, wow, Wesley learns about insurance. I got to have it. Not going to happen. Wesley learns about credit. Credit, I want to learn about that too. Investing, I, no, kids are not going to do that. Kids are going to pick up Spider-Man, Batman, you know, blah, blah, blah. If I had the opportunity at the Boys and Girls Club to go swim, play basketball, hang out with my friends, talk to some girls, or go take a financial class, I'm going to go do, I'm going to go play basketball. I'm not going to go take a financial class in my after school time, right? So it's up to the parents up to the grandparents, it's up to myself, it's up to us to put these things in the kids' hands to where they can start having conversation. You know, Wesley learns to invest. We're, we're having a conversation about it. It's a kid's book, it's a kid's storyline, but in this storyline, we're learning about uh, we're learning about uh, appreciation, de depreciation. We're learning, you know, about credit. We're learning about, uh, you know, dividends and this or whatever the case may be. So it has to be subconsciously taught because the parents are not teaching this stuff. Right? I mean, the schools are not teaching this stuff, right? So culturally, in order to change this, you got to put medicine in the candy, right? So you look at these books. They look like regular old kids' books. Oh, look, it's a children's book. We're going to read it because I got tired of my son, Wesley, coming home teaching me uh, – you know, with these little books that were like, oh, uh, that was about nothing, right? How can we get this in schools? I'm starting one school at a time. I'm in a couple schools, a couple libraries, but that happened over time. Small, independent guy uh, doing my thing, independent, you know, even when I got the call from Berkshire, even, uh, you know, even Buffett told me, hey, this is some good stuff, you know? Uh, even, you know, when Warren come into his office and said, hey, this is some good stuff that I could have used this as a child myself. And I just knew I was on the right path. You know, I'm like, man, I just got blessed by the greatest investor of all time. But I'm just keeping on my path, taking one school, one library. And Max B, to be honest, I just got to have the support. You know, yes, I'm on Walmart.com, all this stuff to get more popularity behind it. I have to show that this is something that people want. And the only way I can have to show that people want is through sales numbers. And like I, I was reading, uh, I was watching a documentary, The Godfather, The Black Godfather. I think it was called on Netflix. I love documentaries, by the way. It's called The Black Godfather. One of the things he said that stuck with me, he said, this world is all about numbers. Everything is about numbers. Life is so much about numbers that when you're born, you're given a number. And when you die, you're given a number. Well, the Social Security what is the day you're born and the day you die? You're given a number. So this whole world is about nothing but numbers at the end of the day. I go to a retail. 
I go to a school, a bookstore, anything. They want numbers. What is the sale? Will people buy this? Will you know what parents want this? That's just how it boils down. How do you first meet Warren Buffett? Oh my God. Go watch my other show, young boy, 24. <laughs> go watch my show, the meeting and uh meeting and dinner with Warren Buffett. I did a whole uh episode and show on that. I don't want to get into that again. Sterling Silver, if you plan any incentives to market your book in Georgia, I would be glad to help if possible. Sterling Silver, actually, I'm going to be in Georgia. That's my hometown. I'm going to be in Georgia uh, next month. We're going to do, uh, I'm going to be in Georgia. I'm going to be in Waynesboro, Georgia, back in my hometown on July 25th at the Waynesboro City Hall. We're going to uh, dedicate March 16th as Children's Financial Literacy Day back in my hometown. So if you're in the area, you know, definitely come out. Big shout out to Mary Carr as well. I just saw him text me to, to while I was on the, talking to you guys. So the mayor is dedicating the day to Children's Financial Literacy Day back in my hometown. And March 16th is significant because that's Wesley's uh, birthday. So he the one that kind of really pushed me on this path. Because if I didn't have Wesley, I don't think I would have wrote any of this stuff. So uh, big shout out to Wesley and my hometown for the support. Um, okay. Mike Mess, oh, he's speaking to somebody else in the group. But yeah, so that's what anything, anything you start from the ground, anything you start from the bottom, you just build it. You know, you just build it uh, slowly. You build the first book to the second book to the third book to the fourth, uh, the cartoons. You know, I don't put out the cartoons as fast because they're expensive and they take a lot of time to write. So I have to do what I can and be consistent the way I can be, even with this show. You know, this show is six years old. I've been doing this, been on YouTube now for six years podcasting for two or three years, um, you know, going to school, learning about still in school, you know, like you guys, my last certification was chartered portfolio manager. The one before that was a credit financial counselor. The one before that was, I don't know, life insurance, health insurance, series 65, series 53, associates, you know, financial specialists, all that good stuff. So, but just keeping it going on and pushing it, that's the only way to get there. Kids are not going to, um, buy this stuff because it's not, they don't understand it, right? Half of us adults barely understand it. But if we have enough and we start having these conversations about insurance, how many people are dying from insurance? And insurance is the, the easiest way to build wealth. I have it set up, hey, prince get killed, wife and son become millionaires. <laughs> Doesn't take a lot to I don't have to do any type of crazy backhand investing and none of that stuff like that when I can just do it like that, right? But getting rich the slow way is what we don't want to do, right? Uh, what's the cheapest platform for a day trader? Um, I would say that I know of it's probably Robinhood. Bolin, I think that's who asked that question, Robinhood. Now, when you say day trading, Day trading, most accounts are going to require you to have about 25000 not to just day trade, but if you want to be in and out of the market, because if you go in and out of the market like two or three days in a row, meaning you buy a stock in one day, sell it the same day, if you do that like three days in a row, they're going to, and you have under $25,000 in your account, they're going to put your account on freeze. They're going to call you, I think it's a pattern day trader, PDT. Uh, you sit down with PDT. They're going to list you as a pattern day trader. So if you have under 25000 I think that's, that's like an SEC rule. So, But you can buy something and sell it the next day, and you won't get caught for that. right? It's even like options. If you buy options, buy and sell an option the same day over and over and over, you know, or whatnot. But then again, that go back, Tony. Why do people want to day trade? It's a small 8%. My guy, Oliver Velez, y'all saw him on the show. He is somebody that can day trade. Right, he's a great day trader, best one out there that I've seen personally. And you know, he's in that small percentage of people that can do that. Why do people want to get into day trading? Because it's cheap, it's fast, it goes back to the whole it's the microwave. It's hey, I put this in there five minutes later, I'm eating. I don't have to go to the store and season the chicken. And we all know how long does it take to build a Rolls Royce? I think they said six months. But you can build a Toyota in 13 hours, right? But at the end of the day, which one is going to be a high quality? That Rolls Royce or that Toyota, right? And if you got to look at it. Day trading, 92, 93% of those people are losers. 
92, 93% of uh, option traders who option trade every day are losers because they were doing it that well or they were day trading that well, you know, they wouldn't be on YouTube trying to sell you a program or TV trying to sell you a program. They would just get rich. And there are some good ones out there. There are some guys who can do it. But I know if I sit back in option trade and I push that off to this audience, hey, option trade, option trade, knowing that 98% of the people are not going to be able to do what you do. It's just like the guy told me about the basketball camp that I said earlier. He was a professional basketball player, and he was teaching all these other kids how to become professional basketball players. But he knew in his heart of hearts, 98% of those kids, no matter how hard they tried, they were not going to go to college and get a full ride. He knew 98% of those people were going to be losers, and that's why he wanted to change his whole program. And that's why I started doing it. Instead of teaching people, oh, guys, look, I made this much money off of this, 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 and this. You know, um, if I made money off of this, this, and this, and this, and have you people repeat this over and over and over, knowing that the people that try to mimic your system is going to lose, come on now. Keith Key says, wow, congrats. Oh, thank you, thank you. Mike Messes Prince, what matrix do you look at when you determine a company's intrinsic value? For me, is P slash BV below one, low debt, consistent net profits over at least three years, and what attracts me to a business. Same concept, right? I look at cash flow. I look at the cash flow of a company. I look at the debt of a company, and you got to look at the profits. Revenue, 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 revenue. That's the first thing. If I wanted to sell my company today, the first question anybody's going to ask me, how much money does this company make? <laughs> how much you made last year? How much have you made in the last five years to justify this price? And what I do is I get the market capitalization. If the stock is going for $100 and they have 100 shares you know, available, you know, 100 times 100, let me show. I think it's 10,000, right? Zero, 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 four zeros and a one. It's 10,000, right? So, okay, um, this company saying it's worth $10,000. Does it have the revenue to justify its, um, thank you there, young boy 24. Um, it has a $10,000. Now, does this company have the revenue to justify being evaluated at $10,000. So I'm looking at the revenue, right? Amazon, Walmart, Microsoft, Facebook. I don't know why there's such a huge backlash against these apps. They help millions find sources of income. Which apps are you talking about? Like Robinhood? I don't know what apps you're talking about. But when I that's what I look at for a company. That's, how I, that's my first. No, nothing's wrong with Robinhood. Because think about it. If I see and ask you, hey, man, what's the best computer to get on and use the Internet? I'm going to sit back. It doesn't matter. Right now, I'm using a Mac. My buddy with next to me is using a Dell. My cousin is using a uh, Toshiba. Uh, my other friend is using a, a, a Microsoft Windows, whatever the case may be. We all got on a Google and went to go buy Ford stock. We all going to get the same price. It don't matter if you use TD Ameritrade, Scott Trade, the app, Robinhood app, uh, Charles Schwab, whatever broker you call up a broker, you're going to still get the same, what you call it, right? The only thing I don't, I'm not too crazy about Robinhood. I don't like the, the, the tools to be able to see everything. Webull, I never use Webull, right? But I can't use all the tools. That's my only thing. Stash investing, that's, that's not bad. But so... I don't, when people say, oh, you get a bet, you know, anytime, anytime you gain three followers, you're going to have one hater. That's just life. Every time three people clap, somebody's going to frown. That's just like, you know, it's people out here that hate my show, <laughs> hate me, For whatever reason, I don't know. Should you still sell all of your stocks? Why would you sell all of your stocks? I don't know why would you want to sell all your stocks, uh, you know, Florida, Florida. I can't even say your last name. But anyway, it's getting late, guys. It's getting late. I got to go run up here and see what Wes is doing. Make sure he's not eating me out of house and home. And um, I got to go in here and uh, get ready to shut everything down. It's 830 over here. 
I enjoy everybody that's coming in. Hit the thumbs up button if you're in here. I appreciate it. Yeah, MT Finances, Betterment, so many apps. I don't know who would hate your show. Oh, crap. You know how many trolls I got to delete? People that, you know, write in and say crazy stuff. It's crazy. That's just part of the life. Hit that thumbs up button, guys. Don't forget to hit that like, subscribe, comment, and share button. Share away. Thank you, guys, for uh, said, how many companies do you own? I'm you know, I'm highly concerned in areas of my circle of competence. You mean like stocks? Uh, no, Sterling Silver, no. Waynesboro, this is uh, definitely what you call it. You know, uh, whoever, no, it's, it's open to the public. Please don't come in and shoot me, please. I don't want no, no crazy people to show up. Yeah, it's open to the public. Uh, Waynesboro City Hall. You'll see me promote it more. Next week, it's going to be all about my book launch at Broncos Boys and Girls Club. Then I'm going to talk about the new city, uh, the city hall going down to my hometown, Waynesboro, Georgia. I'm going to put it out. Follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. You're going to see me talk about it. Uh, great show. Said whoever gave me a thumbs down suck. <laughs> Said got you. I'm senior at TSU. Nash, thanks for all the advice. I'm really learning a lot. Oh, yeah. Thank you guys for tuning in. I've been on here for an hour. I got to get out of here. But I appreciate it. Uh, DM me, all of the good stuff like that. Until the next video, podcast, cartoon, or whatever else you see me do around the globe. Peace, be safe. I'm out, and thank you. Ah.